Okay, so an overview of the body musculature. We're going to start with the axial musculature, and then we're going to jump in and continue with appendicular musculature. These first few slides are just an overview of muscles from a couple different vantage points. We're looking at an anterior view, and again, we primarily are going to see superficial muscles. Now, I'm not going to spend very much time on these first few slides because uh, I do want to spend the majority of time uh, honing in on specific regions. So uh, this doesn't really give us, you need binoculars or opera glasses to see uh, and read what's going on on the screen. However, when you're working on your uh, lab assignment and portfolios, you may want to refer back uh, to these uh, uh, for identification purposes. And again, in under the unit six folder, you want to remember that there are uh, slides in there. Uh, a few of you have started printing them out. That there are slides in there that do go through uh, muscle identification uh, as well. And the keys are included uh, in there. So anyhow, we're going to keep moving. The posterior muscles. On this slide, I wanted to mention too, uh, with regard to muscles and actions, we do see uh, fiber direction going in a multiple, uh, in multiple fiber directions going in multiple directions. I don't know, that may seem kind of redundant, uh, but uh, we do see uh, the angle of these fibers uh, in multiple uh, directions. And those angles uh, of fibers uh, are relative or they relate to uh, the direction of movement that uh, occurs. Remember, when we look at muscles and we look at the fibers, we think of these as, uh, them as being uh, bundles of, of microscopic puppet strings, and these strings are going to be anchored uh, by the puppet master, in essence, at the origin site. And again, that origin site is going to be some sort of bone or bony landmark. Typically, we'll, we'll see a few muscles that kind of plug into soft tissue and connect to other muscles. But for the most part, we do think of muscles attaching to bone, skeletal muscles. So the origin tendon is, again, kind of the anchor or uh, where everything gets drawn towards. Uh, the insertion tendon is going to be the opposite uh, aspect of the muscle uh, that's going to be attached to a different bone. And uh, that's the bone that's going to uh, be moved. So insertion uh, tendons always move the bone toward the origin uh, tendon. So um, we'll keep that in mind as we go to, we'll talk more about muscle actions uh, throughout the evening, but you can see a broad uh, origin, broad insertion, or even just broad muscle in general probably is going to produce more movement. As we go through, we'll see a couple of really broad uh, muscles in the posterior aspect. We see the shoulders, the back, and the gluteal region. Uh, those are very big muscles, very broad muscles. They help uh, with a lot of posture and, and locomotion and, and uh, basically keeping uh, everything uh, somewhat in uh, alignment most of the actions that we go through are with these anterior muscle groups. We do a lot of uh, anterior or uh, front actions, or especially nowadays, everything is in here, uh, whether it's driving, whether it's screen time, uh, whatever reading, whatever, which is screen time nowadays, uh, whatever it might be, uh, we're in here quite a bit. You guys, of course, working on your AMP, you're, you're in this mode, whether we were in face to face or not. Everything to, sitting, everything is in a state of flexion. It's almost like the fetal position. And so um, getting the posterior muscle groups to do more work uh, through uh, a non sedentary lifestyle, through movement protocols, walking, uh, you know, stretching, different things like that. Nowadays, we're seeing people do more uh, Pilates and yoga, um, whatever, it's stretching, right? it's plain and simple. Movement, if that's what you want to call it, uh, we're definitely promoting that more postural awareness. But again, getting those posterior muscles, uh, those extensor muscles to be more active, that's really the goal. 
especially when you're working in orthopedics or physical therapy. And by the way, uh, and then we'll move on from these first three slides, I want to emphasize regarding actions of muscles that generally all of these anterior muscle groups, and, and again, this may seem like rhetoric, this may seem like it could just goes without saying or it's, it's obvious, but I want to say it anyway. All of these muscles in the front of the body are going to create front actions or anterior actions. So anything that we see here in the front of the body, the actions produced by these muscles are going to be in an anterior direction. So contractions and the prime movers uh, of these particular prime movements of these particular muscles are going to be in an anterior plane or direction. Notice too, that our uh, model is in correct anatomical position, arms to the side, palms facing forward, thumbs out to the lateral position. Okay, so again, it probably is obvious and goes without saying, but uh, it, I think it may help as we go uh, when we analyze muscle actions. Now the posterior muscles produce the opposite actions of the anterior muscles. So as the, so in other words, most of those anterior muscle groups that we just saw uh, are going to have antagonist muscles in the posterior region of the body. So if we create an action in the, in the anterior, we do have to create an opposite action in the posterior. So uh, again, these muscles are they're just moving bones at joints. So the movement happens at the joint, the bones are what are moving. And again, any anterior movement is going to have to lead to posterior movement as well and vice versa, typically. Um, and again, you know, these are uh, prime movers and antagonists. Okay. Lateral muscles are going to create lateral movement. So a lot of the muscles then that we see on the lateral aspect of the body are going to produce some sort of lateral movements, whether it's uh, abduction, uh, whether it's some sort of rotation, la lateral or external rotation, lateral flexion, uh, some sort of action that's going to, uh, we see lateral flexion of the trunk. So in order to get my uh, trunk to move to the uh, right side, I need the muscles on the right side of my uh, trunk to contract and produce that movement. So again, probably goes without saying, but uh, you can see that uh, in full effect as we go. Uh, the other little groups that we do see are going to be these medial groups. Medial muscle groups are going to produce medial actions. So when we have muscles that are located on the medial portion of the body, we're going to usually see adduction uh, and again, more medial uh, types of or bringing toward the midline types of action as opposed to going away from the midline. Okay. Uh, let's see. We do, we'll see some muscles that can, that move in multiple planes, of course. So when we do see that, such as the deltoid, the deltoid we can see in all three of these illustrations. We see the deltoid from an anterior view. We see the deltoid from a posterior view. We see the deltoid here in a lateral view. So that means the deltoid is pretty dynamic. It's gonna produce actions anteriorly, posteriorly, and laterally. So, um, so anyway, a couple of folks, I don't know if folks are checking in or have questions. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, please. <laughs> That's how it goes in class too. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. The, you know, the, uh, and especially as we go through the individual muscles and start isolating some of their actions and locations and actions. Uh, yeah. In, in class, there's a lot of, activity and movement so that's that's a good thing so yeah keep doing that uh, and you can certainly impart this information onto your uh, families uh, members as well uh, white is going to be uh, oh, a little bit of, of a few things a good question 
uh, step. Well, all of your questions are great, but but as it pertains to this moment, yeah, the white is going to be either tendon. So some of that, and, and and again, we can't tell necessarily just by looking at it. Each of these are going to have uh, potentially different names, but some of these are, t are represented by t the white is represented by tendons a lot of it actually some of it's represented by ligament uh, and some of it's represented by what we call uh, apo or apo it's apo and we'll see this term in a few minutes neurosis and aponeurosis or aponeurosis uh, we see it right up here at the top of the skull um, that oftentimes is going to be found where a muscle uh, instead of attaching into a bone part of the muscle may actually kind of attach into kind of a tendinous uh, material or even ligamentous. Tendinous and ligamentous is under the microscope is very similar. It's going to be that dense regular connective tissue. Um, but you could see how we've got a muscle here. It plugs in and it looks like it may plug into the skull, but in fact, we'll see in a few minutes more clearly that it plugs into a soft tissue sheath that then plugs in to another muscle. So we kind of have a muscle connecting to muscle uh, with a sheath in between them. Typically, we don't see this very often. Uh, typically, most of the white that you see, uh, and then there's a fourth one, most of it's gonna be tendon. Some of it's gonna be aponeurosis or ligament. Uh, the fourth may be a, a little bit of fascia uh, thrown in there. Uh, as well. And fascia is just that connective tissue kind of covering that oftentimes brings uh, muscles or connects muscles together. Because again, um, it, it may be a little more uh, obvious before I move away from these slides, because we're not going to see the, the total body viewpoint uh, again. Uh, of course, you can go back and see it anytime you want to. But uh, for tonight, we're probably not going to see these full body ones uh, again. But you can really get a, a pretty decent view, especially we'll do the, the posterior view of how all, the, all of these muscles are connected uh, with fascia. What we've done here is removed most of the fascia. If we were to, to, to view this in, as a complete uh, with skin, we would remove the skin and then we would see a layer of fat, that hypodermis, that subcutaneous fat, and then that's going to be attached to a thin layer of kind of opalescent uh, fascia. And so uh, in order to actually separate and get this, and again, this is a, a drawing, but even in reality, we could get something that looks distinct where we can separate the muscles out. It doesn't look like, if I just remove the skin, it's not going to look like this. It's going to be covered in fascia. So that fascia gets removed, and then we can actually see all of these muscles uh, kind of individually. But if we put the fascia back on or we leave it there, that fascia connects and links every muscle uh, from uh, base of the skull, top of the head, all the way down to the bottoms of the feet. So uh, we could see issues all the way down here with the feet due to, again, some sort of isometric issue with footwear, with heels, uh, just generally, uh, you know, we see uh, varicosities with, uh, especially with uh, nurses, uh, waitresses, um, uh, delivery folks, uh, customer service folks, factory work. I mean, people that are on their feet constantly have to have the appropriate footwear. And if they don't, even just a slight a subtle change in an arch or a heel can alter how these muscles back here, the calf muscles contract, that can, it's almost like a domino effect. It just trickles right up. It alters the shape of the fascia, can alter the, then the, the hamstrings, the gluteal muscles, and then look at this big connective tissue sheath in the low back and all the way up to the point where uh, we see folks that get severe headaches in the occipital region. We treat that area, treat that area, treat that area, and then we realize that, uh, whoa, maybe we've got a, uh, we have some sort of uh, orthopedic issue down with the feet. And uh, sure enough, we'd make some alterations there. And next thing you know, they've, you know, 
these headaches all the way up here subside. So again, all of that uh, fascia connects all of those muscles. And we see it here. And you've seen fascia, again, I mentioned it earlier, I think a week, maybe er last week, or maybe in this, uh, maybe it was Tuesday. Fascia is that when you have like a raw chicken breast, there's that, that sheath of, of kind of thin tissue around it and then there's kind of a yellowy chunk usually that's a little chunk of fat uh, and and if you kind of cut that fat or pull that fat away that that clear kind of connective tissue that stays with the muscle and kind of covers that that chicken breast that's all fascia so um so anyway fascia is really important when it comes to um it comes to pain management actually and and posture and so we'll get into that as we go uh further tonight yep yeah shoulders uh yep all connected good so yeah start making those connections uh, again part of part of what we do uh, when we learn AMP again is it's for your livelihood yeah I want you to be able to to know these to take an exam and to do well on the exam yeah I want you to to take this knowledge forward uh, and, and get your pieces of paper but I really you know I can't emphasize enough the importance of thinking about yourself as as part of this process of learning and understanding anatomy because you've lived inside and with this this uh, uh, this organism your entire lives you're as familiar with you with you and if you aren't you you'll you probably have become more familiar uh, this semester and then hopefully you continue that forward uh, but to, and especially when it comes to bones and muscles and pretty soon we'll get into the nervous system and digestive system and, and respiratory kidneys things that you know, we work with and deal with every single day and have, have for our whole lives and maybe kind of not I don't want to say take it for granted that that's kind of, it's almost like you've been naughty, you know, you, nobody's been naughty here you just, you know, it's just the way it works. We don't, we don't emphasize K through 12 science knowledge, let alone human science knowledge. So you have to be an elect, <clears throat> it's usually an elective, you know, in high school, your senior year uh, for one semester, if you were fortunate enough to be able to do that in high school. So, uh, and again, oftentimes the perception is I just got to get this work done. I just got to make the grade. That's fine. The, that comes with the grade just comes with the work, but, but really thinking about this stuff is how it's related to you. And then those that you know, those that you work with, those that you love. And, and again, you'll see things differently. You're, you maybe already are, like terminology uh, as we're learning these first, now we're in week six, almost seven, or maybe no, we're in week seven, almost week eight. You know, we've been together seven weeks and you've learned a whole bunch of new words and you're seeing now when you're watching, I don't know, if you're watching TV, uh, probably watching the internet and seeing different uh, commercials. Uh, maybe if you're driving and or at the store and you're seeing different uh, things, or you're just hearing things, uh, you know, while you're watching a video or seeing the closed captions, you, you, you may be seeing words uh, totally differently, uh, you know, in, in more of a medical context and uh, break, being able to break things down differently. So, uh, so yeah, this is your, your, this is a life, your lifelong learners and this information is, is certainly to be utilized uh, throughout your lives. So, um, so skeletal muscles, uh, we're going to move into uh, the specifics. Again, we have over 600 skeletal muscles uh, in the body. They are micro, tiny, all the way up to, uh, you know, the, the back muscles that we saw earlier. So we do have a, a pretty wide range. We also have a variety of shapes and sizes. We looked at uh, some of that earlier uh, on Tuesday. We saw um, uh, fiber directions are different. Uh, so and we just mentioned, you know, even the attachment aspects. We see tendons, uh, aponeurosis, there's that term right up on top. Um, we see uh, I mean, all kind of fascia involved, some ligaments uh, involved, especially uh, around the knee area and the shoulder areas. So yeah, we're putting all these different puzzle pieces together, all these muscle puzzles. 
Yeah, the cell. I know, right? The cellular. Craig says the cellular level. And, uh, yeah, every week, right? Good. Well, I hope I, I hope so uh, that uh, that your minds are are blown. And I told you, I warned you guys at the beginning. You get your heads are going to be so big by the end of the semester uh, from filling it with so much information. You're going to have to uh, have uh, uh, you know an, ex, an extension put on your homes and uh, maybe uh, get bigger doorways put in. Uh, so anyway. Um, as we go through, the, the other thing I want to mention uh, for the rest of the night as we go through each of these slides, and again, we're only going to focus on about 30 or so muscles. Uh, uh, um, and as we do, you're going to see a variety of oddball names. Now, remember from Tuesday, or recall from Tuesday, these names are oftentimes what bone is involved. And oftentimes the name of the muscle, when it does involve the name of the bone, it's, it's a lot of times it's the bone name is the origin bone. Not always, but a lot of times. So we'll see muscles with bone names. We'll see muscles with actions. We'll see muscles with just kind of general locations or areas. Um, we'll see shape names. So this first slide, we'll see some muscles that have more than one bone in their name. So those are nice because that, that muscle name tells you all kinds of information. Where it begins or, is or, or its origin is and where it's inserted. So we'll see some of those as well. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind, I, I'll mention a little bit of origin and insertion as we go. And whenever I mention insertion, again, we're talking about the movable part. So um, if a bone is named, or if a muscle is named for its action, then that can give us a lot of clues regarding maybe what uh, the insertion is. Because remember, the insertion is the action part. So the insertion is the movable part. So if the name of the muscle uh, is the a an action word, then that oftentimes can give us a clue re to uh, what bone uh, the insertion tendon is on. So anyway, I'll make light of that and, and remind you of that as we go. This first slide is a great representation of everything I just uh, got them mentioning. We'll start right at the top of the head. We have a, a big muscle right on the forehead that uh, we can call the frontalis muscle. We're going to see some of these muscles, a lot, a lot of them end with IS or US. So an IS or an US on the end oftentimes is indicative of a muscle. Uh, so we, we see with this first one, it has a combination. It has a couple different names. Uh, occipitofrontalis tells me that we're dealing with the occipital bone and the frontal bone. This is actually two muscles uh, kind of combined into one connected by this aponeurosis. So uh, we start right away with kind of an oddball. We don't really see this very often throughout. So we're just going to get the oddball out of the way and then and really kind of keep moving. So, uh, but this is a prime example of seeing a muscle named for uh, the bone that it's attached to or one of the bones that it's attached to. So we have this muscle separately could just be called the occipitalis. This muscle separately could be called the frontalis. Uh, we do combine them and we also call this the epicraneous muscle. Uh, you can see this called the epicranial aponeurosis. That's a mouthful. So, um, so epicraneous, uh, upon the cranium, right? Epi means upon, upon the cranium, okay? Epicranial aponeurosis. This uh, muscle in the front wrinkles uh, the forehead or raises the eyebrows, scrunches the forehead. We have a couple other little muscles that, that work with some of that. Like uh, there's a little guy here. We're, we're not going to worry about it, but that'll bring the eyebrows down. Because again, if I, if I go up, I have to be able to come down besides more than just relaxing the muscle. I can just go up and then relax, but I can also bring down. So we're going to see uh, there are a few muscles. There, there are more muscles in the face has, out of the 600 muscles, the facial 
uh, area in the cranium have a, a, a high number of those 600. So um, some of the real tiny ones are going to be located underneath and deep to these larger ones. Um, so anyway, we'll keep going. We have uh, another one named for the bone it's attached to called the temporalis. And the temporalis, we'll, we're going to see this coming up in a different slide uh, because again, this, this, it's kind of covered up. It, this doesn't really do it justice regarding how large it's uh, origin is. It's a very broad muscle and it does converge and pass underneath uh, that zygomatic arch or that cheekbone. It actually goes underneath it and plugs into the mandible. So remember, action is insertion going towards origin. So if the insertion is down here, the origin is up here, we move insertion towards origin. So the temporalis action is gonna to be to elevate the mandible or to close the mouth. So that's a talking uh, muscle, that's a chewing muscle. Uh, we, we oftentimes can see, uh, especially, um, so I see it a lot with like these coaches on the sidelines that are chomping their gum and you can see the like muscles popping out of the side of their head. That's part of that temporalis muscle. They're grinding their teeth or gritting their teeth or chewing gum. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that also is one I mentioned the TMJ, that temporal mandibular joint. Temporalis muscle is oftentimes one of the culprits, whether it's a trigger point, uh, whether it's just in, in a hyperspastic or overuse state, uh, that can lead to uh, excessive jaw clenching and a TMJ disorder, maybe grinding of the teeth, ringing of the ears, that type of thing. So uh, we're going to keep moving. Another one named for its bone. Uh, let's travel down to, in that similar area. So where the temporalis uh, plugged in uh, to the mandible, we can't really see the insertion. So in another slide coming up, I'll have most of this muscle removed so we can really just see the temporalis and a couple other muscles. Um, it is deep to the next one, which is called the masseter. Uh, and again, you know, I'm not expecting you to, to just etch these in. But if you were to see a word that said temporalis and were asked where is maybe, where is this located? you know where the temporal bone is. So from multiple choice options, you can use your reasoning to figure some of these out. So keep that in mind too as you go, uh, especially with muscles. A lot of times they, they tell quite a story just with their names. Masseter is next, and you may not know the sciency word for chewing. Uh, the sciency word for chewing uh, is mastication with a T. Yeah, you want to be careful with that one, mastication. Uh, so the masseter helps with mastication or chewing. So this is a muscle that in essence is named for one of its primary uh, actions. So again, we do see an anchor uh, up along uh, the zygomatic arch. We see an insertion down around uh, the uh, angle of the mandible. So again, it's going to that, that's one too that you can, if you clench your, your jaw, if you palpate the side of your cheek and then you clench your, cheek, clench your jaw, the masseter will pop right out. That's another one that you can see some of these guys or gals that chew gum, you know, and are really intense. You can see that one popping out too. So you get the temporalis popping out, you get the masseter popping out. This is a really big muscle. Uh, so again, our jaws create quite a bit of, of pound of force. So these are relatively large muscles. Now we certainly don't create as much force uh, as uh, some of the big cats or some of the uh, uh, larger reptiles that are able to chomp like uh, crocodiles or alligators. They have really big cheekbone uh, arches, so they get really big musculature through there to accommodate the uh, amount of force they need to generate to be able to brace, basically break uh, a bone uh, open to get to some of that marrow. Um, so anyway, that's what's going on. Those are two big muscles for getting the jaw to close. Uh, there's another one that's named just a little bit anterior to the uh, masseter. It's right in the, the buccal area. Buccal means cheeks. Okay, You may re recall that from back in week one 
when you were just starting on your introduction to anatomy, we, we looked at, uh, you know, what some of these basic terms uh, for anatomical location meant. And one of the ones we didn't spend a lot of time on it because we were going to see it later was the buccal area. Buccal means bugler or bugle. Uh, so if you were to play a bugle or a, like a trumpet or coronet, you would need to kind of pucker your lips. So the buccinator is kind of like a, a lip puckering uh, muscle that's in the sides of the cheek there. Okay, the bugler muscle. Okay, so that's uh, there. Do, 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 do travel uh, to this one. We'll stay in the same area. Again, another muscle that's just named for, for where it's located. Typically, if it's just one muscle, uh, one bone named within the muscle, it's probably the origin. So with this one, we see the zygomaticus. We see a major and a minor. We're not worried about two different ones. Just the fact that if you saw zygomaticus uh, on a test or, or on a, a chart, you would know we were dealing with a, muscu a musculature uh, in this region of the zygomatic bone. So uh, it does anchor, it comes down, and that one's going to be one of kind of your smile muscles or uh, the, the Elvis lip uh, smile, uh, or I guess that's a smile, the Elvis lip, it's, it's patented, probably has its own uh, name. But yeah, that's going to be the zygomaticus muscles that are able to do that. Now, lastly, in this little area, I'm not going to spend much of any time on these two. I just want to mention them. We do have two what are called orbit muscles. We don't see this very often throughout the body. These are sphincter muscles in essence. They're circular muscles. Um, so orbit has to do with, with circular. Um, oculi for this eye one, oculo of course has to do with the eyes, right? Like binoculars. Uh, and orus has to do with oral uh, or the mouth. So we see orbicularis oris and orbicularis oculi are circular muscles around those areas. So if you were to see those terms, again, the name of the muscle does give you a lot of information about it. Uh, we're going to conclude this slide with, uh, with one more here. Yeah, they don't really show the other one. So we'll do one more on this slide and we'll see, we'll see this one again. Um, it's called, it's the long, one of the longer named muscles. I've mentioned it before a little bit. Um, it is hyphenated here, uh, but it is one long word and that long word is sterno and then clido and then mastoid. So all together it's sternocleidomastoid. We do abbreviate that clinically, thankfully, as SCM. So the SCM uh, is a large muscle on each side of your neck that starts up uh, kind of behind the ear at that mastoid process. That's the insertion point. It actually originates down on the SC, the sternocleido. So we do have sternocleido here, sternum, clavicle. In fact, those two bumps are called the SC joint. Uh, those are the bumps for the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, so sternocleido, and then it, it, uh, you get one going up to the left, one going up to the right uh, to each of the mastoid processes. So that insertion point is going to be the mastoid process. So this muscle, is, is, it's nice. Yeah, it's long, and we can abbreviate it, and it tells us a lot about its location. Uh, sternocleido up to the mastoid. So the mastoid being the insertion or movable part uh, and the sternocleido being the origin, remember movement or action is insertion going toward origin. So the action of, of uh, the SCM is uh, multiple actions actually. Um, the primary action if we, if we involve both, so we say bilateral contraction. So both SCMs shorten or pull. So they're anchored here. I run the puppet strings up to the back of my ear. I pull those down. I pull. So I'm bringing the two mastoids closer to the two SC joints. I'm going to get uh, a flexion of the neck. Okay. Flexion of the, or of the head, flexion of the head, flexion of the neck. Okay. I could just do one though, right? What if I want to just pull this particular SCM? So it goes from here, okay, sternocleido right side to, to the mastoid on the right side. I shorten that cord or that wire and it's going to create this type of action. So we're going to get 
uh, opposite side neck rotation. So again, you don't, I, you don't have to remember all of that. If you remember, if you saw the word sternocleidomastoid and, and you, you thought sternoclavicle mastoid, oh yeah, that's that big muscle right here. You're, you're probably doing pretty darn good. So, um, and again, if you can, if you, and you can even do the action, if you look to the right, you can palpate that muscle and actually or look to the, I just looked to the left. If you look to the left, you can actually palpate that right side muscle. It's, it's a lot uh, more contracted. The muscles shortened a little bit. If you look to the right, you can palpate the left side one. The other thing I want to mention before I leave this slide is we do have a clinical uh, hotspot, uh, a clinical relevance hotspot. Uh, it's a triangle. It's like the carotid triangle area. Um, and the sternocleidomastoid is one of the sides of the triangle. Okay, so you can see right in here, we've got a, a triangle. It starts here, kind of goes up this way. And then uh, one of the other sides of the triangle is going to be uh, that part of that mandible or the, the, the uh, uh, inferior angle and kind of that where that ramus comes down. So we can see kind of the edge of the mandible there. And then as we get to uh, this area, that's where the trachea is. So we have kind of the, the lateral edge of the trachea. So where the sternocleidomastoid comes down and the trachea is, there's a little triangle right in there. That's the spot where the carotid artery is palpable. Okay, so when you're trying to palpate the carotid artery, you can trace the trachea and, and your fingers almost take you right into that little spot right there. But the SCM is, is part of that uh, edge or one of the sides of that carotid triangle. Um, let's see. Uh, this is just the same thing we just saw. There aren't any new muscles really on here, just from a different viewpoint. We get an anterior view this time. Um, so let me back up. The artery is going to kind of, it's going to be on, so you can kind of see some of this muscle here. That's going to be some of the hyoid, uh, what they call, uh, uh, there's a, what they call sternohyoid muscle. We'll see in a slide coming up some of these other throat muscles. But yeah, there, the, there's not a lot in this area. It's going to run over top of those muscles, but it does disappear. There's a muscle they don't show on here. It's a very thin sheet. It runs right here. It's called the plate muscle, uh, like a paper plate. Uh, it's called the platysma. And it's the kind of the muscle if you if you uh, um, kind of uh, protract your jaw and lean back, it's this muscle right here that kind of puffs out. That's the platysma. That's right in this. It, it kind of runs right along here. So the the uh, carotid artery kind of appears uh, from from the clavic clavicular area where that SCM is. It kind of appears. And then uh, the SCM is over top of a portion of it. And then it makes, like I say, in that little triangle, it does make a little bit of an appearance. So there isn't much between the outside and that little portion of carotid artery right in that spot. There's just going to be skin, so epidermis, dermis, some uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, maybe a little bit of, of uh, fascia in there. Uh, there's there maybe a few lymph nodes uh, right in that area as well. Uh, there are some salivary glands that are kind of right under in, the, in that area too. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of stuff kind of taken up uh, this area, which you can see uh, for, um, all of the, the musculature. Uh, what you don't see is the, the vascularization uh, from the carotid as well as uh, the lymphatic system, uh, as well as uh, some of your salivary glands, uh, as well as the fascia. And then obviously the skin we don't see. But yeah, there's, there's, uh, it's very uh, palpable. In this spot, it's very close to the surface. The SCM does cover it up a little bit, uh, certainly in that uh, uh, 
right around the kind of the uh, the SC part, the sternocleido part. And then it does disappear under a couple of these uh, stylohyoid muscle, uh, which you can kind of see here. It kind of disappears. See this little dark spot? That's where it's then going to disappear. And then it goes in through, there's a couple of holes on the base of the occipital bone that uh, we're going to see it pass through uh, into, the, uh, into the brain, into the cranial cavity. Okay, here's some of those other, that's uh, um, stylohyoid. You, you do not need to do anything with this slide. In fact, I, I really don't want to spend more than a couple seconds on here. Just kind of show you maybe where, where we're looking. We've got the styloid process and then the hyoid bone here. We've got a muscle there. We've got a lot of musculature uh, kind of at the floor underneath the tongue. Uh, f again, most of these are for speech uh, and chewing or mastication, as well as uh, back here, we would have some swallowing uh, muscles as well. And then we see the voice box location, and then right behind the voice box is where uh, we're going to see uh, the esophagus or the food tube. So there's a couple of, of hot spots here for ligaments as well as for muscle to uh, basically ensure that our food and beverages are going down the proper tube and not down the, the windpipe or the uh, trachea. Here's that temporalis with uh, a lot of the other musculature removed. You can uh, see how broad that foundation or that origin is, and then it comes down and plugs into that, uh, just one of those little bumps, the anterior bump uh, of the uh, mandible. We also cut the masseter too, so you could see what's going on there. And then uh, with, by removing the masseter, uh, we can also see how far back the buccinator goes. In the previous couple of slides, we saw that masseter uh, covered up quite a bit of the buccinator. And again, the buccinator does, does the pucker, the masseter, and it does the, the jaw clench, and the temporalis also helps with elevating uh, the mandible. Don't worry about anything on the right uh, side there, let her see. And again, we're sticking uh, with axial muscles. So we just got through uh, the major muscles of the cranium and the face. Now, there are certainly several more, but those are the key ones that you wanna be, that you wanna uh, have at least some uh, exposure to. Uh, when we go to the posterior area of the neck, we have a, a few things going on here. We see our first uh, major uh, muscle uh, of, the, of the entire body. The trapezius muscle is one of the biggest muscles of the body. It's also one of the most dynamic. Uh, it has multiple origin spots. So uh, you can see all of this is going to be origin tendon and it even kind of disappears into more uh, tendinous material. Uh, but it does, uh, the trapezius does originate uh, in some respects at the base of the skull. They're called nuchal lines. You don't need to know that. If you were again are a PTA or orthopedic, you would know the nuchal lines. Uh, but those are basically the landmark uh, ridges at the base of the skull where uh, the trapezius and a few other muscles are going to plug in. Uh, so again, headaches, uh, occipital headaches uh, could be related to uh, shoulder problems. Notice the trapezius comes all the way out. It inserts uh, onto the spine of the scapula. It's connected with fascia of the deltoid muscle as well as the platysma muscle out in the front. So we've got the, the platysma, uh, the SCM, the trapezius, uh, and the deltoids all kind of locked into the same spot. There are, there are a few others as well, but these are the main uh, culprits that we oftentimes see. And one of the main actions of the trapezius is going to be uh, to shrug the shoulders or elevate the shoulders. Uh, so again, a lot of the work we do, a lot of the stress we have, uh, you know, uh, carry, carrying weight, whether it's uh, real physical weight, whether it's emotional and mental weight, whatever that weight is, if it's out in front 
oftentimes we're up here. We also see it, there's another muscle. We're, we're not going to name it at the moment. It's sitting right here. We'll see it shortly. Uh, but uh, that also helps with elevating the scapulae. The trapezius and this other muscle are big dogs when it comes to headaches and neck problems. Uh, these, these particular muscles uh, are normal for a, a protective uh, position. Um, again, uh, the, the, this is the epicenter of everything. Right? All roads lead to the central nervous system. They lead to the brain. Uh, we're going to see with the endocrine system next week, the hypothalamus, pituitary, our major glands. We're going to see the pineal gland all located uh, within the brain, so in the cranial cavity. So it's very important. Uh, our eyes, ears, nose, our special senses, right, that, that it'll enable us to, to be able to uh, understand what's going on in our environment. So all of this musculature uh, exists to be able to protect, right? Whether it's in a macro scale or whether it's subtle contractions, right? I mean, you, you maybe not even tell, but I'm shrugging my shoulders. I'm contracting my shoulders. Ah, now they're relaxed, right? I mean, there's, uh, there, it doesn't take much to get these up here, okay? So again, postural awareness, Whenever you're faced with a stimulus is the first thing you do when you respond is it bring the shoulders up in a defensive uh, manner in a protective manner, uh, you know, or, or is it, you know, just pay attention. And, and if so, it's natural, right? It's normal. But to what degree and once that, that stressor that you've perceived is over, are you still up here? Are you still down here? Uh, is it bills? Are you tweaking out? You know, it's the end of the month. What's well, the middle of the month? It's a bill. <laughs> you know, I couldn't wait to get old when I was little. And now that I'm old, I would prefer to be little again. I don't have to worry about bills. But uh, they're never ending, right? It's like uh, first of the month, uh, the second week of the month, the third week. It's, it's throughout the whole month. It seems like something else is coming out. And, you know, we could be up here about it. We could be beat red about it. We could close off some of the blood flow and, and start getting uh, tension headaches back here. And remember, what's back here? The occipitalis, too. This plugs into that occipitalis muscle. Where does it travel? Well, remember, it plugs into that aponeurosis, and then it ends up with the frontalis. And remember, that frontalis has plenty of fascia that links it to the temporalis. So we could be getting uh, headaches here. We could be getting headaches here. We could be getting headaches here. Uh, and it could be, they call them tension headaches, but um, oftentimes, yeah, the tension is in the shoulders uh, or in the neck. Um, I tell uh, patients that uh, uh, neck pains usually have names. Um, they, it usually, uh, it might be, you know, uh, Joe or Sally or whatever, right? Pains in the neck. So yeah, sometimes you have to analyze maybe the, those pains in the neck that you're experiencing may have actual proper names to go with them. Uh, so keep that in mind too. If it's bills that are, if it's, if it's proper names that are driving you, that are giving you headaches and neck pains, if it's bills that are giving you headaches and neck pains, you are the one uh, that's, that's possessing that 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 protective mode or that that pent up mode whatever it might be so it's up to you to let that stuff go and 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 understand how you're going to manage it when you're dealing with stressors like that uh, that are that are creating these types of of muscular responses when they become chronic issues and they're not addressed that leads to uh, uh, chronic metabolic issues, potentially chronic pain issues. We see blood pressure problems. We then see kidney issues, uh, enzymatic uh, assimilation and digestive issues. So uh, again, understanding stress, understanding coping skills with stress. It, that's something that, that we really, again, we're, we're we, <laughs> All behaviors learned, right? Or it would seem to be, I don't know, we're probably born, some of it's innate, but a lot of behaviors learned. And if you're learning uh, coping skills, uh, which we all do, whether it's unwitting or, or, or 
reality and, and we're paying attention to learning coping skills, which most of us at age one, two, three, four, five, we're not aware of like coping skills. It's those around us, our teachers, our parents, our, our whatever's, the, the influencers, uh, the peers, those are, that's uh, how we manage to develop coping mechanisms. And uh, coping mechanisms are uh, to be on the defense and to be uh, holding things in. Uh, if coping mechanisms are to fight and to be angry and to be nuts, you know, those are coping skills that as an adult really don't fly uh, in the real world and they don't really fly uh, in the fake world either. And uh, either way, no matter what world you live in, uh, you get to a point and an age in life where those prior coping skills uh, are detrimental to your overall health. So uh, these are the types of things that we're understanding more and more when we're dealing with our patients. Uh, by no means are any of us psychotherapists or psychologists. I'm not even sure the psychotherapists or psychologists are psychotherapists or psychologists for that matter. Uh, they're just more pushers uh, for the most part. But uh, as far as I can tell, but when it comes down to it, we are, we are as nurses and as, as, as general practitioners dealing with folks who have a variety of ailments and conditions, we do become uh, uh, more than just uh, checking out the, the body's uh, physical manifestations and signs and symptoms and leaving it at that. Uh, we're trying to understand more, uh, at least a little bit, you know, about lifestyle without putting the couch in the, uh, uh, in the uh, exam room. Uh, we're, we're getting little bits and pieces of what maybe this individual is going through and how they cope uh, with uh, what they're going through. And, and they'll t they tell you, most of them, based on where they work, what type of work they do, what type of family situation, what type of financial situation. For the most part, our patients are under a lot of stress, just like you and I are, but uh, that, that yeah. it's, it's how we cope with the stressors that uh, enables us to, to be able to, to see more clearly and to uh, uh, make more uh, uh, decisions that uh, have a better foundation in critical thinking and uh, pragmatism as opposed to uh, being emotional and subjective and, and judgmental. So... Um, so that's your goals. Those are your goals too, as nursing and medical students, is to work on uh, understanding your own coping skills and your own perceptions of stress. So, and 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 understand how is your blood pressure affected? Uh, how much real estate uh, in here is being taken up and occupied by tenants who aren't paying rent? You know, so uh, sometimes you have to uh, evict some, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, some hangers ons in the real estate uh, of your mind. So whether it's ideas, whether it's individuals, uh, whatever it is, if it's bringing up on this, uh, you've got to let that stuff go. So in order to change, you can change perception and how you perceive uh, those incoming uh, stressors, or you can turn your back and, and let them uh, be someone else's. So, uh, or some combination, but, but yeah, holding, on to things we see it all the time manifesting uh, musculoskeletal uh, stressors and, and mental stressors manifesting and leading to other issues uh, throughout the body so this just happens to be a hot spot right all of us know uh, about the neck and shoulder uh, area Okay, so the trapezius uh, is a dynamic muscle. It, not only do we see it elevate the shoulders, uh, it can also uh, kind of bring the shoulders back a little bit. We can see if these particular fibers are pulled and shortened, we would, we would kind of pull the scapulae down. So the trapezius is a very important muscle for kind of maintaining uh, that posterior uh, kind of uh, location uh, of the uh, shoulder girdle or the pectoral girdle. Uh, and the anterior aspect, again, we have the SCM and the platysma are kind of assisting and working with the trapezius to keep everything balanced. Okay. 
And again, if the SCM and blood pressure and, and trapezius, if all of that is just bound up, you know, we see headaches in that respect too, you know, uh, pressure changes and uh, dramatic, cha you know, that can lead to uh, aneurysms forming. Um, an aneurysm is a weakening in an artery wall. So when an aneurysm bursts or ruptures, that's when we have a, a, a real problem. So if we can uh, recognize an aneurysm uh, that's forming based on, again, a series of diagnostics and interviews with our patients and uh, intake and, and what we, you know, certainly running them through maybe a, an MRI or a PET, CT scan or something like that to maybe isolate where uh, we might be seeing an aneurysm. Typically, they're going to be in the brain uh, or in the abdominal region. Uh, and again, it's almost invariably due to chronic stress and chronic high blood pressure because when blood is, is pumping hard uh, against some of the, 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 roo the roof of some of your, the, I don't know, is it roofs? That just doesn't sound right. Roofs? Yeah, we'll go with roofs of some of your arteries in the brain. If the pressure is, is high all the time, uh, that blood is hitting the roof of the of the artery and it's weakening the wall just like a balloon and so over time that aneurysm can uh, that weakened wall can get bigger and bigger and bigger you've maybe seen it in like uh, some of your like a hose or something I know if like a the green part of the hose gets cracked and you've got that inner lining where the the black part is sometimes that'll just start puffing out uh, and then uh, eventually it could rupture so uh, so anyway Anyway, paying attention to stress and musculature and where we hold our stress is, is also extremely important uh, to longevity and vitality. All right, so uh, trapezius and sternocleidomastoid, we'll look at uh, these, this muscle here and, and this little batch here. We'll look at those in the slide uh, coming up shortly. These two we're not too concerned about, the splenius capitis. Um, just just means uh, head splint, uh, but again, those are going to come up to and, and kind of help with uh, the kind of almost the opposite too of of what we're seeing from the SCM or the antagonistic uh, properties of the sternocleidomastoid. We would see with splenius capitis. So it basically helps to keep your head splinted. It literally means splint uh, for the for the head. Okay, so um, look at a few trunk muscles. Um, we've got the two intercostals, the external and internal intercostals that elevate uh, the ribs and then uh, depress the ribs or bring the ribs back down. So uh, when we perform an inhalation, we need to see the entire rib cage, including in between each rib. We need to see each of those elevate and expand out a little bit. Uh, again, really, uh, breathing is fascinating. We'll, we'll look at it in more detail next semester. We, we study it just a hair this semester. We'll, we'll look at respiratory just in a, in a way that uh, um, analyzes some of the main organs, but we don't really get into too much with respiratory dynamics. Um, but I will tell you, since we're here with the diaphragm, uh, that's that we've seen it before. That's that large muscular wall that distinguishes your thoracic cavity and your abdominal cavity. Um, the only thing we really see uh, within the diaphragm is uh, where we get any type of thoracic and abdominal interaction would be through a couple of the blood vessels that are either taking blood away from this area down into the abdominal region or bringing blood back up. So we're going to see some artery going down and some vein coming back up. Um, and then we'll also see uh, the esophagus leaving uh, or passing through the diaphragm before it opens into the stomach. Uh, but uh, again, it's a complete wall though. So again, we, one of your case, little mini case studies, again, discussed, I think, abdominal fluid potentially seeping up into the thoracic cavity. Uh, that shouldn't uh, happen under normal uh, conditions. So if it does, there's a puncture somewhere. But this diaphragm has an origin spot down on the kind of the anterior aspects of some of the, the bodies of the lumbar vertebrae. And so the insertion part is, is just, kind of, they call that the central tendon. 
uh, and so basically we're going to, as, as, uh, um, when the diaphragm's relaxed, like what we see here, uh, the lungs are, are, I don't want to say deflated, but this is, would be post exhalation. So the, this individual has just exhaled. We're between breaths at this point. Um, in order to get air to come into the lungs, we need to see a, a volume change in the lungs. Air uh, generally goes from an area of higher pressure to a, an area of lower pressure when we're dealing with a container. And the lungs are containers. So high pressure outside uh, and low pressure in the lungs will lead to air going from high pressure to low pressure. In order to get that pressure to change, and normally it's pretty even between breaths, but in order to get that pressure in the lungs to be lower than the pressure outside of the body, we have to increase volume of the lungs. So volume and pressure are inverse have an inverse relationship. So as we increase the volume of the lungs, the pressure in the vol in the pressure in those lungs is actually going to decrease so that's going to cause air to then rush into the lungs so breathing is passive but uh, inhalations generally do require a little bit more of an active thought process not really much it's, but when it comes to more of a deep or what we call a diaphragmatic breath we're going to involve a little bit more of a conscious awareness to get the diaphragm to kind of relax and then uh, or go from a relaxed state to being contracted and as the diet so what we see is the lungs the the inferior aspect of the lungs is actually through the pleural uh, membrane it's actually connected to the diaphragm when when the nerve from my brain going to the diaphragm gets a signal the diaphragm will do this it'll get the signal to contract and when it contracts it flattens out so we've got a lung sitting on top of the the diaphragm when it flattens out it actually pulls the lung with it and it increases the volume of the lungs so it's pretty cool and as that volume increases pressure goes down Think of volume and pressure this way, you know, a, a can of Coke uh, is pretty, a 12 ounce can of Coke versus, you know, a gallon uh, soda jug. The, the can of Coke is a lot smaller volume, but there's a heck of a lot more pressure in that can than in that big tank or in that big gallon. So anyway, that's some of the basics of why the diaphragm is so important for, for respiration, particularly inhalation. Uh, without the diaphragm being able to flatten out and pull the lungs with it and increase the volume of the lungs, thus decreasing the pressure, thus allowing air at a higher pressure to move to a lower pressure, we would uh, have problems breathing. So uh, about 75 plus percent of our ability to inhale comes from uh, the fact that we have a diaphragm. So it's an extremely important uh, organ uh, or muscle. There's a nerve that innervates the diaphragm. It comes off of, of the, around the C2, what they call the cervical plexus area in the high cervical region. So any type of trauma to the neck or cervical region that's above about C3 or so, uh, there's a good possibility that's going to do some damage or even affect, uh, completely affect, uh, negatively affect the uh, transmission of electricity uh, down to the diaphragm. So uh, a severe neck injuries above C3 or so are going to require some sort of ventilator for life more than likely unless uh, the swelling, unless it's just a swelling issue and the swelling comes down and then uh, energy uh, is restored. A couple other muscles, and then we'll move on from the uh, uh, axial region. Uh, we do have, uh, we want to look at the anterior and then posterior aspects of the abdominal area. We do see uh, the pectoralis major muscles, uh, large muscles of the, of the chest area, very broad origin, heading out to a small insertion uh, down kind of in the armpit area. We're going to see, so if, if this is the insertion out here, if I pull this string, it's going to bring my arm uh, into uh, kind of like a horizontal uh, flexion 
uh, kind of an aspect or even just regular shoulder flexion. So we do see several things going on uh, with uh, the uh, pectoralis major. Um, when we go to the, so again, this is an anterior muscle to create anterior movement. I need a, a muscle in my posterior aspect that's going to plug in to almost the exact same spot as the pectoralis major to actually pull on my humerus and get it to go back into this direction. And you've probably heard of that muscle. We'll see that uh, uh, is called the latissimus dorsi. So uh, your lat muscles, L-A-T. Those are those, those kind of big wings that you can kind of see, especially like with bodybuilders. They have those big back muscles that kind of stick out. Those actually plug in almost to the exact same spot as the pectoralis major, and they both create their antagonists of one another. One creates uh, anterior movement uh, of the humerus and shoulder girdle. The other one creates posterior movements of that same area. Okay, and then we come down a little further and we can see uh, uh, the, we've removed, by the way, we've, the, the left side doesn't look like this and the right side looks like this. We've obviously removed uh, the, the superficial muscle and tissue. So um, we do see when we get to the abdominal group, we have four abdominal muscles. So the first group is the, the six pack uh, abdominal group. Um, we see linear fibers there that are gonna create uh, trunk flexion. So uh, this is called the rectus abdominis. So these are, rectus has to do with the fiber direction. They're going to be erect fiber direction, and it's in the abdominal region. That one speaks uh, uh, for its, uh, or the, the name tells it all, I guess what I'm trying to say. We also have uh, a couple of oblique muscles, uh, the second and third. So first, rectus abdominis, second and third are going to be these oblique uh, muscles. We have external, oblique means angled. So we're going to have uh, two layers, external oblique muscles. Uh, so they're going to create oblique movements. We know that the trunk uh, is able to do more than just flex uh, and then stand back up or extend. We can twist a little bit. Uh, we can angle, uh, you know, uh, right side uh, down toward the left side. Um, that's the oblique groups. Uh, those are the oblique groups that are able allow us to do that. External oblique and then internal oblique. Um, and then the deepest of the abdominal muscle group is called the transverse abdominis. So again, it tells us the fiber direction is going to be a transverse or horizontal. And really the transverse abdominis uh, action is more or less a, a little bit of a passive action. The, the transverse abdominis uh, behaves almost like a weight belt. It kind of keeps the, your abdominal contents uh, you know, it kind of keeps them in. Uh, so uh, this transverse abdominus runs all the way along. Well, it plugs into this Linnea uh, alba or this white line here. Uh, and then the other one plugs into that same spot. So transverse abdominus fibers are going to run like this. And, it, and again, it's just kind of behaves as, as like a, a containment belt uh, for, your, uh, for your abdominal viscera. So those are the four abdominal uh, muscles. Here's a look at them in a um, more of a transverse cut or, or a uh, cross section. We can see, again, it looks a lot like bacon. And in fact, bacon is the, uh, the abdominal group of the pig. And uh, again, the more fatty the bacon is, the more sedentary the lifestyle was of the little porker. And if the little guy was running around a lot and was a free range pig, uh, he's gonna have maybe a little more muscle uh, than fat. So, uh, but as you, if any of you cook, uh, fatty bacon is very good for flavoring soups and dishes and other things, right? Uh, so some bacon fat isn't bad. Now consuming straight bacon fat, probably not a good idea. Uh, really consuming bacon is probably not that good of an idea, but it is pretty yummy. So uh, if you're consuming bacon as, as just bacon strips, you want to maybe 
maybe go for bacon that's going to have a little bit more redness to it. Uh, that's going to be have a little more protein. Uh, the fat does give flavor. So 50-50 uh, split maybe. I don't know. So, um, so that's your bacon. And then we've got um, some posterior muscles. We've already done the trapezius. We did a little bit with the latissimus group. Um, there are a couple more on this slide moron. I, I didn't mean that. There are a few uh, extra muscles on this slide. Uh, we have uh, three of the four rotator cuff muscles. For the rotator cuffs, you want to remember uh, that it's four muscles and it, they form an acronym, SITS, S-I-T-S, SITS. And the first S stands for supra meaning above, like superior, spinatus. So we see the spine is the spinatus part. So above the spine muscle, supraspinatus. Uh, that's going to be above the, the spine of the scapula. And then we have the eye is infraspinatus. So that means inferior or below the spine. These were also called uh, supraspinous fossa and, and infraspinous fossas uh, if we were to look at the bony landmarks on uh, the scapula. But those are the first two rotator cuff muscles. They anchor uh, themselves uh, in the scapula and that supraspinous fossa and infraspinous fossa. And then they come out and, and kind of go underneath that acromion. Uh, process and then they plug into what we call the greater tubercle, a uh, couple big bumps uh, on the, the proximal aspect of the humerus. Um, so that's where those, those first two, the S and the, the S and the I rotator cuff muscles go. And then we have what's called the teres minor. With a, a, the, the minor means that there must be a major. Otherwise, it'd just be the teres muscle. So the teres minor uh, is a smaller uh, muscle uh, relatively to the teres major. Teres major is not a rotator cuff muscle. Teres major doesn't do uh, much with rotation. It does more uh, maybe with uh, some adduction or some, some uh, extension uh, of the shoulder. So when it comes to rotation, the rotator cuffs in the posterior area are supra, infra, spinatuses, and then the teres minor. All three of those, so that's your S-I-T, all three of those plug into the greater tubercle of the humerus, which again is proximal and lateral uh, bump. Uh, of the humerus. Uh, we'll see the fourth rotator cuff, which is an S, S-I-T-S. -S. We did supra, infra, teres minor. The, the last uh, of the group is called subscapularis. So it's underneath the scapula, underneath the scapula, anterior scapula, but underneath the scapula then would be kind of between the rib uh, cage and where the scapula butts up against the ribs. So if we peel the scapula back, there's going to be a muscle there, and that's the subscapularis, and that's going to come up and plug in as well uh, to the, I believe, the lesser tubercle, uh, more on the anterior portion uh, of the uh, proximal humerus. So the three in the back, the three SITs, do rotation toward the back, and then that subscapularis does rotation toward the front or internal rotation. So those are the four rotator cuffs, S, I, T, and S. They're uh, oftentimes injured, uh, again, uh, in uh, repetitive use. Um, we've, we've had folks come in, uh, plumbers uh, come in with rotator cuff injuries quite a bit because of, of the work they do. And they do a lot of reaching and grabbing and weird positions and cranking and uh, pipes that have odd, you know, all it takes is a pipe that's that they're holding and they get a weight shift and it shifts back really hard on them or shifts forward. That can blow out a rotator cuff. Roofers, um, mechanics, we see uh, rotator cuffs uh, a lot uh, coming around. Um, and then we've got the two rhomboid muscles that we've taken the trapezius on the right side and removed it. And we have these two rhomboid 
muscles, the rhomboids, you just need to know them as the rhomboids. Uh, they're going to anchor themselves along uh, the thoracic vertebrae, the upper thoracic vertebrae, right along those spinous processes. And then they're going to come plug in on that medial border of uh, the scapula. So the rhomboids are going to do this action. Again, we're looking at posterior muscles creating posterior actions. Rhomboids are going to pull the scapulae and, and kind of keep them back. Now, the rhomboids are very good at fixating the scapulae. We're, we're going to see the biceps muscles come up and uh, plug in a little bit on the front of the scapula. And so if, uh, if I need to lift something in an anterior direction, uh, with my biceps, uh, I need my scapula to be a little bit more anchored down. So it's good if you're doing any heavy lifting in front of you, you want to make sure you kind of anchor and stabilize, uh, fixate uh, your scapulae with your rhomboids and then pull whatever you're trying to bring in. Because if you just try to go grab something, you're going to potentially hurt your, hurt your rotator cuffs or um, you could sublux your shoulder and possibly even dislocate it. Um, so uh, again, the rhomboids. Um, women generally uh, have more shoulder issues and rhomboid issues than men. Uh, breast tissue is, is extra weight in the anterior portion, re really just right anteriorly to this area is where breast tissue is. We're already used to being in this position just naturally. The weight of breast tissue does uh, kind of round the shoulders or has that, that potential to do that, thus kind of elongating those rhomboids. So it's again, it's very important to encourage the, the rhomboids and the traps to really keep those uh, uh, scapulae stabilized. Again, to, to prevent, um, you know, nervous system and blood to flow issues, uh, pain management issues. We get micro adhesions over time. Uh, we get trigger points created over time. And then we get what's called uh, pain that, that uh, refers to other areas of the body could be related to, to a different area. So musculoskeletal posture and gait and health and stretching and flexibility are all extremely important. And, and ultimately hydration. Uh, again, we're not asking our patients to, or any of you to go out and start prepping for the next decathlon uh, or the, the, the next, you know, the triathlon or Chicago marathon, whatever the hell it is. Uh, we're not asking you for that. Uh, uh, we're just, just any type of movement, you know, we call it uh, uh, consumption awareness and movement protocol, uh, or even just movement awareness, just starting to be more aware of consumption and movement, uh, aware of sleep, aware of rest, aware of hydration, just, just a heightened awareness is what we're looking for from, from, from you as well as certainly from our patients. Uh, because again, it, it just makes everything uh, a lot to, uh, Ah, more calm and, and easygoing if, if that's at all possible, uh, I, which it is. We all know it can, can happen, especially once we get past November 3rd, then we can all just to, just to move on with life, right? Regardless of what happens. Uh, so, who, but uh, uh, that uh, stuff is so far beyond our ability to have any control. It's kind of like our bills. Um, I, I have to pay them every month. Otherwise, things happen, right? So if I don't pay them every month, things happen. I don't want things to happen negatively, so I just pay them and get on with life. Um, do I stress out about bills? Um, sometimes. I think it's natural, too. But uh, it's still my coping skill. I don't need to stress about it because it's there. It's not going anywhere. If I don't have the money to pay the bill, there are options and I have to explore those options. Okay. So keep that in mind. Whenever you come to a, to a wall or, or a perceived wall, it's probably just a hurdle, uh, maybe even a little bump in the road. Uh, there are ways you may be around the bump. There are alternative routes that you may even be able to just muscle through it. There are so many options, but, 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 you know, being bound up about it, 
that's not really an option. Don't panic, don't freak out, just uh, uh, make adjustments. So no matter what your allegiances are on November 3rd or December 3rd or January 3rd or who knows what 3rd when things pan out, however they pan out, okay, it's, you had nothing to do with it. It's not your fault, don't feel bad, nor is it because of you that great things happen, so don't uh, uh, jump up on high and toot your horn. Uh, so keep it level, keep it uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at, at a neutral to neutral positive frame of mind, and don't get caught up in things that are way outside of your scope of understanding. And I think for most of us, national politics is pretty far outside of our scope of understanding. So it's best not to get stressed out. Don't fall into traps of, of whatever the internet or the Facebook or the YouTube or the link, LinkedIn, that's probably fine. Um, Instagram, Twitch, whatever the heck it is. Um, just keep your wits about you during these times because I'm telling you, there are many people around you and you've seen them and you know them that maybe aren't keeping their wits about them. So it's important for you to uh, impart uh, some levity and some stability uh, during times of yo-yo, okay? Because we're on, we're on a roller coaster right now and pretty soon the roller coaster uh, that everybody's going through, uh, whether you are wittingly going through it or unwittingly a part of it just by association and the country we live in, Trust me, it's November 3rd will be here soon. And it's, if anything, we're just going to have a muddier picture than we do now, right? The, 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 just like anatomy. It's, it's a real muddy, muddy river. And I try to do my best to get the filters out and, and get that muck and that murk and that grime uh, cleared out. So uh, that's all I can really help you with when it comes to other stuff. Only you can help you uh, with that. All right. So let's see. Moving forward. And lastly, with axial muscles, believe it or not, we're almost done. We just have a few appendicular muscles. And then you guys need to get on with uh, uh, doing your homework and uh, spending some time with your families and uh, getting some rest and some food and whatever else you need to do. Uh, this looks like a whole lot, and it is, but we only think of this as one big muscle group. They're called the erector spinae. So these guys, this big group helps to kind of keep your spine erect. So they're going to be underneath all of this stuff. We're going to have erector spinae muscles. Okay. Uh, they're kind of the antagonist to these guys so if the abdominal groups are going to uh, allow you to to do this or to crunch then the erector spinae are going to allow you to get back uh, where you, you to home base so um so anyway erector spinae they keep your spine erect all right pretty straightforward all right so before we do these there's a few things i've been kind of avoiding uh teach right <laughs> there you go Amanda, yep. All right. Good, yep. I try, yeah. Life coach. Mm hmm. It's important, right? And you, you become your own after a while. You start to see the, the, the you, you in, integrate these, uh, what we discuss, and, and you, see, you see change. I hope you're already seeing change in your lives for, in the positive over these last uh, six or seven weeks. It's only going to get even more positive for you, uh, as you as you continue to grow. Uh, so remember, growth didn't stop after puberty was, uh, was done. That's just the beginning. You're, you're, I hope when you guys are 80, 90, 100 years old, you still have a growth mindset and you're still growing. There's always new knowledge and new experiences to be had, right? All right, and, and we want to be able to get to that point, so you have to have that mindset starting now, you know, if you don't already. 
All right, so we've already seen these. I just want to bring them up again. You've got the trapezius, uh, you know, plug it into the scapula. But on this side, again, we remove the trapezius. We get a little bit uh, better look maybe at these rhomboids I mentioned. Again, they plug in to the uh, thoracic area and then uh, they uh, insert over here on the scapula. And so if we contract those or shorten those fibers, we're going to get adduction, ADD, of the scapulae. Here's this one I mentioned earlier. I didn't say the name of it, but I showed it to you a little bit. It's, the, it's kind of a helper or a synergist with the trapezius when it comes to shrugging the shoulders or elevating the shoulders. We call it, nicely enough, levator scapulae. So levator means elevate, scapula means just what it says, the, the bone. So this is a really nice one. This tells us not only uh, the action uh, of the muscle, but with knowing the action of the muscle, we also now know the insertion of the muscle because remember the action uh, involves then the movable part uh, along with the insertion. So if the action is elevates the scapula, the insertion must be on the scapula and even more specifically, if it's elevating the scapula, it's lifting the scapula up, the insertion must be on top of the scapula. And that's what we see here, the superior uh, angle, the superior border uh, area, we do see uh, that insertion of the levator scap. Does, does that make sense how the name of the muscle is the, the action, which also then gives us the insertion? Because remember, the insertion is the movable part and the movable part is telling us the action of the muscle, which in this case is also the name of the muscle. Why can't they all be like that, right? Why isn't every muscle named for its action? Then we would know not only the action of the muscle, we'd know the in insertion. From that, we could almost guess what the origin is uh, because we, we do see the elevation of the scapula is the action the uh, insertion is the scapula and it's moving up. Well, what's above the scapula that it's moving toward? Remember insertion and movement. Movement is insertion going toward origin. So origin then by, by process of elimination and, and critical thinking and deduction must be above uh, the scapula. And sure enough, uh, there's not much above the scapulae except for the cervical vertebrae. And so that's what we would see as the origin for levator scap uh, are the, the cervical vertebrae insertion on, on the superior surface of the, of the scapula. We bring insertion closer to origin. That gives us movement. Okay, uh, so that's those buggers. Uh, this one I'm only going to spend a second on. There's there are two things I wanted to show you here. We do see uh, the pectoralis minor. When we took off the pec major, uh, we, it's pectoralis major if we only had, so that implies there must be a minor. Otherwise, again, it would just be called pectoralis. So pectoralis major implies there's pectoralis minor. That minor is going to be smaller, and in this case, it happens to be deeper uh, to the pec major. So um, it is anchored not on the, the uh, sternum, but they're ain't going to be anchored uh, on a couple of the ribs, and then, uh, and then they're going to find their insertion point uh, up on that little knob, that coracoid process of the scapula. So they're going to kind of help uh, stabilize the scapula as well as bring them forward a little bit. Um, but really the key thing on here I wanted you to see is this uh, fourth rotator cuff muscle, the subscapularis. It's uh, right under here, okay, subscapularis, uh, plugging in uh, again to the, uh, um, the tubercle of the, uh, the lesser tubercle of uh, the humerus. So okay, subscapularis. So it's kind of an anterior muscle. So subscap is going to be, be bringing some anterior kind of rotation. Okay. Whereas the other three rotator cuffs are more posterior. So they're going to help with rotation out this way. And then uh, subscap will bring you rotation this way. And again, if you're doing any type of motion, whether it's back or forward regarding rotation, 
uh, all four muscles are going to be uh, doing something, whether it's fixating, stabilizing, uh, while the other one is shortening, or whether it's uh, uh, shortening and, and creating the action while the other one is stabilizing. So uh, usually when there's a rotator cuff issue, uh, it's uh, oftentimes it's going to be multiple uh, issues or issues with multiples uh, of the four. Oh, real quick, I don't, uh, I don't think I quiz you or ask you much about these, but I do want to mention them. Uh, kind of underneath uh, the armpit area, uh, kind of a, on the almost the exact lateral aspect of the upper uh, chest uh, area, we have uh, little tiny, they look like serrated edges. So they call those the serrated muscles or the serratus anterior. So that's these here. And again, you know, bodybuilders or, um, you know, you can kind of see those uh, sticking out right there, those little serrated edges. They're called serratus muscles. So that's kind of nice. Um, lastly, uh, really in this area, I do want to mention the deltoid. Uh, I've mentioned it before, but it is a large muscle of uh, the upper shoulder area. Most of its origin is going to be on the clavicle, uh, then the AC joint, and then back onto the spine of the scapula. So it is a very big muscle. It has a broad origin. It has a really tiny insertion uh, down on the lateral uh, aspect uh, of the humerus. There's a, it's called the deltoid tuberosity. It's a kind of a rough spot on the humerus, but that big muscle and all those fibers kind of converge to that one spot. Because we can see the deltoid from, a, from an anterior view, posterior view, and a lateral view, we're going to get motion and interaction in all three of those uh, directions. So uh, the deltoid primary action is abduction. Okay, so if we do this, uh, so you can palpate uh, the, uh, the uh, deltoid, just put your hand on your shoulder and you can just kind of wing out your arm a little bit. You can feel it gets tighter right there. That's the, what they call the middle deltoid. And then if you kind of come anterior a little bit and you do a, a little bit of abduction, but maybe kind of bring it forward a little bit, you can feel it tense up a little bit right in there. Um, and then in the back, the same muscle of the deltoid, if you perform just a little bit of, of abduction uh, and a little bit uh, toward the back there, some uh, external rotation with that abduction, you can feel the back of the deltoid. So that muscle is dynamic. It does a lot of, of stabilizing, but it also uh, performs a lot of actions that we see and do daily with uh, the shoulder joint. It also is a spot uh, for like a tetanus shot or some of your IM or intramuscular shots are going to go uh, into the deltoid muscle. Okay, uh, really the only one over here, this uh, latissimus dorsi. Uh, again, we see a very broad, it's kind of the lower back cape. It's the most superficial muscle. We saw it a little bit ago, but here's another vantage point. It has a really broad, uh, uh, they call it the thoracolumbar fascia. Uh, so it plugs in to the, about the middle, of, uh, probably about T7 or so, and, and actually travels all the way down toward the sacrum uh, and even a little bit to the coccyx. So we have a really long uh, bit of fascia and a tendinous sheath that all kind of uh, can, comes together and then those fibers converge into one spot uh, kind of in the armpit area on the medial uh, proximal aspect of the humerus. We see the pectoralis major over here also plugging in to that same area, except it's gonna be more on the anterior portion, but still uh, a little bit more medial. So again, the latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis major are going to be antagonists of one another. Okay. As I come forward this way with my pec majors, my latissimus dorsi are, are pulling. So uh, too much movement in here, too much excess pulling or excess actions in here is causing the latissimus dorsi then to be overstretched, right? If I shorten 
the agonist or the prime mover, the antagonist is going to lengthen. So as I do more anterior work with my pecs and with my upper arms, I see the latissimus muscles get lengthened. And, and again, what that does, that, that excessive lengthening of a muscle is going to put stress on its origin site. And, and again, that could lead for, for the lat, it could lead to some low back issues uh, potentially. Uh, we're going to see some other low back muscles uh, here in a few minutes that uh, play a, a, another, you know, a big role in kind of keeping the, the trunk and the, the pelvic area uh, stable. So anyway, here's a lateral view of the upper arm. We can see the deltoid. Uh, again, this is a side view or a lateral view. Uh, this is going to be the front or the anterior. This is going to be the back or the posterior. We do see the uh, biceps brachii in the anterior portion, right? The biceps brachii. And then just underneath the biceps brachii, we have a, a little tiny muscle called the brachialis. Now the biceps brachii and the brachialis work together on the front or the anterior portion of the humerus uh, to enable your elbow to bend. So uh, the two, uh, muscles of the, the front of the humerus are going to help create uh, elbow flexion. Okay, biceps meaning two, right? Biceps, sep meaning head. So two heads, uh, brachii means arm. Uh, uh, two heads are the biceps, uh, the, the, the heads it's talking about. It's not this head, it's the origin heads of uh, the tendons of the bicep. So what it's basically trying to say, uh, so we come over to this uh, illustration, we can see the biceps muscle here. Uh, remember its insertion's gotta be down here on the ulna uh, or radius, somewhere down on the, on the forearm. So that means its origin has gotta be up north somewhere, probably on the scapula uh, or maybe even the humerus, but somewhere above, uh, proximal to uh, the ulna and the radius. So they call it the bicep, so it does have two origin heads. Okay, so we see one origin head uh, coming up this way. It's more medial coming to that coracoid process, that little bump on the scapula. And then there's a little groove right here. Uh, they call this the bicepital or just the biceps groove. Uh, in the proximal, uh, kind of the, almost the toward the proximal head and neck of the humerus, there's a little groove there. And sometimes this tendon uh, can, can pop uh, one way or another. Uh, this is the greater tubercle where we saw the rotator cuffs attached, and this is a lesser tubercle. So that's a groove in between those. And again, we can see that the uh, uh, long head of the biceps comes up, uh, goes through that groove and plugs in. So they both end up plugging in at the same spot, the coracoid process. Two-headed. Okay, and then if we cut this tendon here and peel the biceps back, we end up seeing the brachialis muscle. So both of those are going to help to or be synergists in performing elbow flexion. Now in the back of the arm, upper arm, we have the triceps muscle. So that's a three-headed muscle. So that's going to, it's a posterior muscle, so it's going to create posterior action. So one thing, uh, so if, if I have a three-headed muscle in the back, why don't I have a three-headed muscle in the front? Well, you kind of do because you have the brachialis. The brachialis has its own origin head, and then the biceps has two origin heads. So we have three origin heads on the anterior portion of the upper arm. The triceps has three origin heads on it. So we, we can, my point is generally what we're going to see in the front we're going to see in the back and, and it's going to be fairly similar in construction. So keep that in mind. Let's say I saw somebody, uh, put something, I don't know. My brain. Yeah. So, right. Well, just be thankful, Stephanie, that you didn't, uh, and, or I don't know. I don't think you're a PTA. I think you're an RN, but, uh, yeah, well, maybe this will, uh, if you guys were unsure about whether or not you wanted to get into orthopedics, 
either tonight, either it completely squelched any of those plans or it completely invigorated you and, and makes you want to become a, a physical therapist so or, or an orthopedic physician or nurse. But uh, either way, I know it is a lot and I'm almost done. So there is that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it is a, it is a lot. And, and again, after all of this babbling uh, and, and reviewing and, and analyzing these muscles, you know, really, if, if you if you can remember name of a muscle, uh, you know, the, the big maybe even 15 or 20 of them and, and generally where they're located. OK, so if you if I ask you where the you know, if I if I you know, if you see the word sternocleidomastoid, you're not going to turn and, and run out the door, hopefully. Uh, maybe you would have yesterday or a month ago. But uh, today and moving forward, if you see the word sternocleidomastoid, you can break it down and you can remember sternum clavicle mastoid process and it's in the neck somewhere. So if, if, that, if, if what you guys get from tonight is a better concept of how to see a, a name of a muscle and maybe deduce something about it, that's awesome. That's really what this is, again, an exercise in uh, really this whole 14, 15 weeks is just introducing all of you to new terminology. And, and, and it's a lot thrown at you. But again, it, it's really just you're training your brains to just see things a little bit differently and a little more sciency and with, with a, a little bit more of a critical thinking uh, twist to uh, everything that happens around you. So uh, you'll be glad to know these next couple slides are really quick. I really just need you to know uh, groups. So on the anterior part of the forearm, on the front of the forearm, uh, if I shorten those muscles, I'm going to get flexion. Just remember, if it's an anterior group, it's going to produce flexion. If it's posterior, it's going to produce extension. Okay, so anterior muscle group of the forearms are called the flexor group. That's all you need to know. Um, there's, there's a kind of a separate one. It's not part of the flexor group. Uh, the name of the muscle, again, tells you location. It's the brachio meaning arm, radialis, meaning radius. Remember the radius is on the thumb side. So the brachioradialis is that muscle. I don't know if I can even, I don't pump iron, so you're probably not gonna be able to see it, but it's this muscle right here that comes kind of up over the, they call it the hammer muscle. So it creates, boom, that movement. That's the brachioradialis, arm to radius. So if you, so you wanna definitely, Again, see some of, that's why we do bones first, then muscles, because you, you, you just kind of are putting together uh, some of the terminology. I could make up a muscle name and, and you could tell me where it would be located if it really did exist, just based on maybe the action, uh, the name of the muscle would have action in it or something like that. So anyway, if this is the flexor group on the anterior side, this group is called the extensor group. So that's all you need to know for the forearms. Um, I'm only going to spend about two seconds on this. You don't need to know this muscle. It's called the iliopsoas. It's actually three muscles kind of bound together. Uh, but it's, I just put it here because it's a really deep muscle. Uh, it's a muscle that it inserts down on the lesser trochanter, the femur. So what this muscle does is it basically helps to bring your leg forward. So it helps with hip flexion. Uh, so as we're sitting here, our hips are in flexion, right? Or we're sitting and so our, our, our thighs are forming kind of an L shape with our trunk. Um, so when we, so these are shortened right now, if you're sitting, uh, when you, as soon as you stand up, th this lengthens out. And then every time you take a step forward, whichever leg is moving forward and, and the hip is flexing, so is that muscle. This happens to be, uh, this is the tube muscle that becomes filet mignon when we're dealing with cattle. So beef cattle, if you've ever had filet mignon, it's a, or mignon, however you want to say it, it's this circular kind of, could be a thick round kind of cut of beef. That cut of beef came from a long tubular muscle 
uh, that they that they chopped up uh, right here called the psoas muscle. The iliacus is the tenderloin, right? So so together you get uh, uh, what the hell's that steak called? Uh, you get its tenderloin steak with the uh, uh, with the filet mignon all in one. It's the sirloin and the filet mignon gives you that tenderloin, right? That's the big expensive uh, steak. But uh, so you can get the sirloin or you can get the filet mignon or you can get the whole thing, I think is the, the tenderloin or maybe they call it a porterhouse, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, that's, oh, I, oh, back, I gotta go back because we, uh, we talked about the piggies uh, getting exercise, right? Well, we gotta talk about the cows, we can't leave them out. So if I want a filet mignon that's really nice and got some good, good red meat and uh, not a lot of fat to it, I wanna make sure that cow was out walking around. I want a free range filet mignon or at least a cow that got a little bit of exercise because every time that cow moves his leg forward or her leg forward, okay, in the back, every time the back leg comes forward, that psoas is pulling that leg forward. So uh, if you get a real sinewy, tough uh, kind of a steak or maybe a lot of fat thrown in there, that was a sedentary cow. That guy uh, stood around on cement uh, in a barn probably all day and uh, didn't do a heck of a lot. Maybe he stood at the feedlot line and uh, just kind of hung out. So um, so anyway, those are your meat. That's, that's your meat lesson. So next time you're out shopping for meat, uh, you know what to look for. And you know what you're eating. Uh, maybe I turned some of you into vegans. I hope not, but that's okay too, I suppose. This is a whole, we're almost done, I promise. This whole group uh, here, we're now going to look at the thigh. I want to stop on this group first on the right side of the screen. We're looking at the medial portion of the thigh. This is the right leg and the anterior portion of the right leg. This is kind of like the groin area up here. This whole group of muscles is called the adductor group. So the adductor, you can see it written right over here, adductor group, these adductors all insert on the medial portion of the femur. We do have the insertion of the gracilis coming all the way down onto the tibia. But uh, collectively, these five muscles uh, are going to bring your knees uh, closer to the midline. So when you squeeze your legs together and, and put your knees together, it's the uh, adductor group that's performing this. Um, if you ever hear of, uh, in sports or whatever, sometimes you'll hear about somebody getting a pulled groin. Um, it's 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 going to be any one of these muscles. It could be the pectineus or the gracilis. Uh, it just depends on again what uh, how the injury occurred and where it occurred. If it's a higher up groin injury, it's going to be pectineus. If it's more kind of in the uh, the midline area and, and kind of where the pubic symphysis meets. Uh, and then we can usually palpate along here. It's usually it would be really sensitive in this area. Um, that's going to be the gracilis. But either way, uh, this can take months uh, to heal for some people because again, this area does a lot of stabilizing uh, of the femur, but it, it performs a lot of just your basic actions uh, when it comes to walking. Uh, so Let's move over here. You can see them all clumped together here. We've got a, a, the longest muscle of the body coming up next. It's called the sartorius. Sartorius is the tailor muscle, and a tailor uh, is someone who uh, uh, kind of mends or makes clothing and, and works with material and fabric in that. I think they primarily deal with uh, uh, kind of mending and making clothes. I'm assuming they still exist. Um, but uh, a tailor uh, apparently crosses their leg when they work on things. Uh, so uh, this is the leg crossing muscle. Again, sartor, sartor uh, has to do with a tailor. Um, it comes from the ilium all the way down to the tibia. Uh, and so if I were to bring the insertion toward the origin, it would cause my leg to cross. So if you just put your, so if you're sitting like this and you just cross your leg up like this, that's the sartorius that's, that's allowing you to do that. 
Um, we've got a neighbor here with the sartorius. I'm more on the, so it's kind of a medial, uh, anterior and medial muscle group. So it's just going to create anterior and medial actions. We do have a, a muscle that kind of goes with it called the TFL or tensor fascia lata. Again, I wouldn't expect you to ever remember that. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a pretty large muscle kind of on the lateral aspect of the proximal portion uh, of your femur. What is more palpable is going to be this big IT band. We call it the ilio, ilium tibial tibia tract, the IT band. So again, if you saw the word iliotibial, you could deduce that we're dealing with something that goes from the ilium or the hip all the way down uh, to the tibia. So this IT band is gonna come, it's gonna plug right into the uh, proximal lateral aspect of the uh, plateau of the tibia, and it's gonna come up and kind of plug into that TFL that plugs into the ilium. That uh, IT band uh, is what kind of connects the front leg muscles with the back leg muscles. We call them the quadriceps and the hamstrings. The quadriceps muscle, groups, uh, muscle group is next. We only have a couple more muscles to do. Uh, you guys are troopers for hanging in there. We, we traveled all over the place tonight and uh, we're just about ready to land. So uh, fasten your seat belts, right? So get everybody back to the cabin, uh, uh, back to your seats, uh, 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 trays in the upright uh, position uh, because we're getting ready to land this plane. Uh, so we've got the quadriceps muscles. This is four, uh, four muscle uh, quadriceps, right? Quad means four. So we see three of them are superficial. The fourth one is actually deeper uh, and, and kind of underneath these guys. So we're only really going to see three of them. Uh, the front, the large muscle right down the front of your thigh is called uh, the rectus femoris. We see the word femoris uh, that looks like femur and then rectus having to do with the fiber directions being in an up and down uh, uh, pattern. And then we have two uh, muscles that kind of pop out to, toward the distal area. So kind of on the medial aspect. So if you palpate your, the front of your thighs and you head toward uh, the kind of the medial portion uh, of it toward the midline, there's a pretty big chunk of meat there. That's called the vastus medialis. Medialis meaning toward the, the, med toward the middle or toward the midline, okay, medial. Uh, vastus lateralis, you'd have to kind of run your uh, hand or palpate down uh, on the lateral aspect and you could, would palpate uh, the vastus lateralis a little bit. And again, these, these quadricep muscles are going to help with uh, knee extension. So when you extend your knee out, it's the quads that are performing that activity. Uh, the medialis is the meteor meat with a T, meat ear of the two. It's a little bulkier of the two vastus muscles here. Um, so anyway, if we cut this tendon and peeled back the rectus femoris, we would find the fourth uh, quadricep muscle. It's called the vastus inter medius. That just means we're in between the other two. So lateralis is lateral, medialis is medial, Intermedius is right down the center of the two. Inter meaning between. Whew. So anyway, if you remember out of this whole slide that uh, this group is called the adductor group, the medial uh, portion of the thigh is the adductor group. They adduct the thighs or bring uh, the femurs and the thighs closer together. If you can remember that the sartorius is the longest muscle of the body, that seems to be a question that uh, gets asked uh, frequently. And then uh, the quadriceps muscles, again, are four muscle groups on the anterior portion of the thigh, and they are gonna create uh, knee extension. Okay. All right, uh, almost there. We're, we're getting ready to land. We've got the gluteus muscles. Not a heck of a lot going on there. We do see a very broad origin on the maximus. Uh, all three of them are going to come out to the lateral aspect of the femur. We call that the greater trochanter. Um, this, the gluteus medius is, is uh, uh, 
is not, it's partially underneath Maximus, but a bulk of it is going to be on uh, the lateral aspect of your hip. So this is your, uh, your basically it's your, you know, it's your hip uh, muscle. So if you palpate your hips, that's your, your gluteus medius. And this is the deltoid of the lower of the legs. It's the deltoid of the lower body. The deltoids up here do this. The gluteus medius down there will do that with your legs. Okay. So it's the antagonist of the adductor group. So adductor group brings the legs together. The gluteus medius is an abductor that brings the legs apart. So keep that in mind for that one. And then lastly, uh, we with the thigh, we've got the three hamstrings. Just know we've got three hamstrings. Uh, and one is called the biceps femoris. We have the biceps brachii, flexes the, the elbow. Biceps femoris is going to flex the knee. All right, and that one's more lateral. And then the other two are the semi muscles. We have semi tendinosis, semi membranosis. And again, I would probably uh, be willing to bet that unless you work in orthopedics or PTA, you would only really need to know these as the hamstring group. Uh, but regardless, there they are. Same with the quadriceps. All right, and then we we finally uh, we've landed now. Uh, we're on our feet. Uh, the wheels are, are on the ground. We're just getting ready to pull up to the, uh, uh, to the terminal. And then uh, you guys can go ahead and, and uh, uh, get off the plane and, and head to the baggage claim. But before we do, as we taxi our plane into the uh, terminal, we, we do take a look at a, just a couple more muscles and then uh, we're done. We have the calf muscles. We're, before we get to those, we're going to look at the front or the anterior aspect of the lower leg. We have what's called the tibialis anterior. Now that just means uh, tibialis means muscle of the tibia. Anterior means it's in front. So this is the muscle of shin splints. This muscle, uh, you, if you palpate the anterior portion or the front of your shin, the anterior portion of your tibia, and you point your toes toward your face or point your toes toward the sky, point your toes uh, some, somewhere toward you, uh, you can feel the, that muscle uh, puff up. You can feel the tibialis anterior. Um, so we call that dorsiflexion. Now, the opposite is plantar flexion. When I stand up more on the balls of my feet or the tiptoes, and that from there I see uh, what we call the gastrocnemius. And the gastrocnemius is the calf muscle. Um, it, gastroc or gastro means belly, right? Like the gastrointestinal, like the, the stomach or the belly. Uh, so it does have kind of a big belly, uh, the, the muscle belly. It originates up here on the posterior distal aspect of the condyles of the femur. And then it comes down and plugs in on the calcaneus. And many of you uh, have probably heard, maybe all of you, of the Achilles tendon uh, or the calcaneal tendon. Again, that's going to be uh, back just uh, north of or proximal uh, to the heel. So just above the heel and below your calf muscle is that big uh, Achilles. So um, lastly, and it's named for a mythological character. Uh, I think he was a little bugger and got dipped in the pool of invincibility and he was held by his uh, little tiny ankles in the back and dipped and pulled out and then as time went on, uh, word got out that Achilles wasn't so invincible. Uh, uh, there was a small portion of, uh, of him that uh, was his uh, weak spot. So that's uh, retained its uh, lore throughout history. The Achilles heel of someone is uh, their weak spot. Um, it's also known as the calcaneal tendon. Um, let's see, um, just underneath or deep to uh, the gastrocnemius, we do see a flat muscle, okay, a flat muscle, soleus means flat, so that's kind of nice, uh, uh, a flattened muscle, fillet of sole, right, the sole of your shoe, 
it's a flattened portion. So we do see the soleus kind of mashed in there just deep to the gastrocnemius and actually becoming uh, kind of uh, part of uh, that Achilles tendon with the gastrocnemius. And then there's another one just kind of hidden away over here. Uh, we did a tibia, right? We did the tibialis anterior. There's also a fibula muscle. There's a couple of them, but one called the fibularis longus. So if you did see fibularis muscle, fibularis something, you're thinking it's associated with the fibula. That's the lateral of your lower leg bone. So if you remember that the fibula is lateral, that's not your shin. You can't palpate the fibula very well up toward the shin. There's a lot of musculature there, but there is a muscle uh, up in that area that, that's kind of covering up the fibula called the fibularis longus. That's going to help with eversion uh, of the ankles or eversion of the feet. That's it. Okay, you guys, uh, it's been a nice flight. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, the, the ding it just went uh, ding. And uh, you can certainly uh, uh, ask any questions if you have any. Uh, if you don't have any uh, and, and you end up having some later, of course, please email me. Uh, again, reminders to, to just keep plugging away at your Unit 4, Unit 5 stuff. And then uh, uh, next week, we're going to start in uh, on the next unit. We'll get into, uh, I think we're going to do endocrine system. I was going to do nervous system, but I think we may talk a little bit about uh, some of the hormones and glands. And then we'll segue into maybe the blood a little bit. And then a few other things and maybe we'll finish off the semester actually kind of with the big cherry on top uh, will be the nervous system um, so but uh, I've never done it that way and I think as, a, as we've gone through the semester I think I'm after 20 years honestly uh, uh, of teaching uh, A&P you can, there's a, you, there's a pattern of body system uh, understanding and I've I've tweaked things a few times here and there but, but like I say honestly over the last 20 years or so it's pretty much a similar path and track of understanding the different organ systems and I've toyed multiple times with either putting the nervous system first before every system uh, and then getting into skin and other things or maybe doing skin in the nervous system this time I'm, I think because the nervous system uh, correlates to all other bodies system all roads lead to the nervous system um, but I, I thought that I've tried putting it at the beginning it, it, I don't think it has as, as solid of a, of, a, of, a, of an oomph that I'd like it to have when it's at the beginning uh, simply because you guys are still kind of trying to grasp uh, you're trying to get your feet on the ground a little bit so I, I'm for the first time ever you guys are getting my beta test for putting the nervous system at the very end of the semester. That's going to be your cherry on top or uh, tidying up this nice, beautiful package with a really pretty bow. I don't know. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But I think that's, that's the route I am going to go. I, so um, nervous system is probably the most complex of the systems, uh, and, and in part because it does relate to the entire uh, body and, and all of the other systems. It's ubiquitous that way. And so by the end of the semester, you guys have been exposed to everything. You're very well acclimated for the most part with terminology. I think that's gonna be a really good time to say, here's the nervous system. Here's how everything that you've learned throughout the semester is going to mesh together. And then as we start advanced A&P, we almost jump right into the nervous system. So I think that's going to be a really nice segue and we'll see how it goes. But I, in my mind, as it's planned out up here, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, but in my mind, all things are always rosy and looking pretty good. So, uh, but anyhow, I, I'll leave you guys on that note. You guys have an awesome weekend. And again, hit me up on the uh, email if you need help. If not, I'll see you guys on Tuesday evening. Ask away, Stephanie. You ask it and ver verbalize it or chatize it. Okay, so how does 
elasticity with muscle correlate with like muscle growth like for example like a gymnast they're very obviously very flexible their muscles are more flexible but they have bigger muscles because they're using them more to do their flippies um how is it that even though the muscles are enlarging they're more flexible they maintain somehow they maintain elasticity even by having strength right so well, I'll tell you, there's, there are several factors involved, but it does come down to the two fiber types, right? We're talking about uh, collagen fibers versus elastic fibers. And really our genetic codes, are what we're given to us from our, from our lineage, uh, determine some of that, right? Uh, whether it's ratios or how you want to look at it, uh, but the, cause they are proteins and that's what's in the, that's what's in the code. So um, now, so for the most part, uh, you know, all of, for the most part, we collectively probably have a similar uh, collagen to elastic kind of a ratio going, right? We we're kind of flexible, but not super flexible. We're kind of strong if we need to be, but we're not bodybuilders. And you know, some of us maybe are a little more flexible and less strong. Some of us maybe are a little stronger, less flexible, but the extremes aren't maybe necessarily there. Now, when we're talking about uh, gymnasts and, and other, especially gymnasts, and um, it's like, having that 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 really nice combination there are really any elite athlete is going to have to have a, a, a nice balance of both because too much density and collagen and strength is going to limit some of the flexibility and elasticity and that's what oftentimes leads to injury so uh so in in, in essence they have to go through a whole heck of a, a whole heck of a lot of training. There's a lot of, of muscle uh, memory that's developed. There's a lot of, of repetition. Uh, there's a lot of, of paying attention to consumption, paying attention to breathing and focus and posture and alignment. And, and so what we see, they, they may not possess that amount of bulk, even though they look you know, they look kind of, they look pretty bulky, some of them, but they, they also are very lean. They're very toned. Uh, and that again, comes from, from that, that, the, the type of muscle fast twitch development on some muscles. Uh, but, but ultimately we are encouraging them to, they have to be flexible and they're, they're flexible and stretching and their ability to do that rivals really anybody else. And part of it again is going to be genetics. And part of it is a, a, a very strict regimented routine that began very early on in their lives and, and they've just continued with it. And, um, but uh, now does that mean that I'm at, at 45 years old, if I start, you know, stretching a little bit and, working out my my stretcher muscles maybe doing some theraband tubing and maybe some yoga or pilates am, am i am i going to be able to develop into a gymnast well maybe not but i am still i am definitely going to to promote more elasticity better blood flow and a lower risk of injury while still being able to maintain some of the mass and some of the bulk really it's about trying to maintain balance and, and again it depending on the individual's genetics depending on and their goal some people's goals are to to increase just mass and when they increase mass they decrease that flexibility so you know, you can manipulate it by consumption as well as activity or types of activity, but that's kind of the long and short of it. Does that make once sense? You, once you have the, um, let's say you retire from being a gymnast and your whole life you've had all of these fibrous, elastic tissue um, and you retire, does, do they go away after, with time or? Well, really, great question. Um, I'm not going to say no and I'm not going to say yes. Sort of, um, 
it, it, it does stick around. It's, I, it's very important. That's we're finding this about um, not just with gymnasts, but just sedentary, non-sedentary with youth, right? Our kids, especially nowadays, our zero to 18 year olds are more sedentary really than ever. I mean, between the tablets and the staying inside, not riding bikes, not doing things, not working, they don't want to do anything, right? Um, not all of them. I don't, I'm not trying to generalize, but I guess I kind of am. We're, we're seeing more and more sedentary youth and we're, we're not sure what that's going to down the road as a society, but we do know that, that yes, developing, um, the, uh, a physical framework of, of whatever it might be. So, so being active in something as during the developmental years, the, the zero to 18, like zero, I don't, but I get from, you know, ages five to 18 or whatever, you know, as your body's growing and you're laying it on that foundation by being more active, by stretching, if you're in gymnastics, yes, if you stop at 16 or you stop at 18 or you stop at even 12, if you were, you know, you will likely retain some of that flexibility even if you take a, a 20 year break and decide man i want to start doing yoga again or, or not again but i want to get into yoga because it's sort of related to some of the flexibility stuff i was used to back when i was a kid you're gonna absolutely you are gonna have a a, a, a head start on that just by by having established a, a foundation in in fibrous that's more elastic based with with some of the density that's involved so yeah absolutely i've i I see it all the time and i've seen it all the time over the years and i so i really emphasize and promote to folks who do have children again i'm not asking folks to, to run their kids ragged either you know these parents who put them in they're they're at the at the at the gym at 4 a.m or 5 a.m they've got swim lessons at 6 a.m and then <laughs> after school they've got soccer practice and then after that they've got cub scouts and then on the way to 4-h they got to stop at you know <laughs> the key club or why well, don't you it's just uh, they, you know and they never sleep they never have that rest time so i i think there's there's a balance in everything right so we do want to figure out this some kids demand a little bit more. Some kids, you know, maybe their parents need to demand more out of them. I mean, there's so many avenues to go, but, but yeah, physical activity uh, in youth, no matter what it is, even if it's just stretching, even if it's just doing some yoga, even if it's doing Pilates or, or just, just regular calisthenics and, and, you know, we don't necessarily need, you know, the, 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 the massive amounts of, of, uh, you know, of uh, like uh, cardiovascular work and running them ragged maybe. But, but yeah, we, we do know that long-term it makes a huge difference. I can tell when a patient comes in at, at, when they're 50 years old, I can tell what they were, pro whether or not they, and to what degree of activity they went through as a child. It's all, you know, it's slam dunk and, and, wow. um, and a lot of it has to do with flexibility, elasticity. Um, and then again, some guys that were more football and wrestling and were more into bulk, you know, at, at 12 to 18, they come in at, at 45 or 50 and they still have that same kind of like, you know, body type and, and they haven't done anything. They haven't been in a gym in 30 years, but that they, they still have that kind of bulk. They still, cause they did it early. And then I have folks who have did nothing, right. They, they, from zero to 18, they were, they were inactive. They didn't, they, they barely got up, went to school, came home. That was the extent of their activity. And then as an adult, they decide they want to start working out. They want to start getting, they just, they have that urge or that desire. And, and yeah, they have a tougher time with it they have a tougher time sticking with it they have a tougher time with the the, the aches and the pains and the soreness and and the development uh, the cardiovascular aspects come into play as well that's not to say they can't develop it and work at it and work at it because of course they can you know we we, we all but we that were very active are going to have an easier time when there's a dormancy or a layoff picking it back up mm -hmm. yeah interesting all right, that's all the questions I have. Yep. So don't believe that if you don't use it, you lose it. 
not necessarily true, but it's still a good idea to be in a little bit of a practice of, of at least daily stretching and, and just kind of, you know, uh, breathing and just kind of relaxing your abdominals. We hold so much in our solar plexus, the abdominal area, and that's where a lot of stress goes. And uh, sometimes just letting your guts hang out and just kind of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who's around, even if you're private or whatever, just, just relax and, and, and yeah, stretch a little bit. And, and it, it just, you know, cleanses everything and kind of gets the ball rolling for the day. If you do it in the morning and then throughout the day, as you kind of recognize a little tinge or twinge or tweak or pain somewhere, you may just need to need to take a break. Usually it's your body's nerves saying, you know, we've been kind of like agitated enough. We need you to leave, <laughs> leave us alone for a few minutes at least so we can, you know, relax. But yeah, that's, that's you know, uh, that's the long and short of it, I'd say, Stephanie. All right. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You guys have fun this weekend. I'll see you next week. Okay.